Lord, we can sing tearfully because of its agony, but joyfully because of its blessing to us at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. We thank you you didn't demand any payment from us. We thank you, Lord, you didn't st expect certain standards of morality, but just as we are, we came. You said, just as you are, come, and that's how we came. And you said, him that cometh, I will in no wise cast out. Lord, we are so varied here tonight. Our backgrounds are so varied. Some of us, no doubt, brought up in strict mor morality and Christianity. Others far, far away from God. But Lord, we think of this little ga girl there. We prayed be a comfort in that well tonight. But Lord, we were in a pit far deeper, and you reached down and lifted us up. Not only lift us up, but set us up. Not only set us up, but tuned us up. Put a new song in our mouths. Even praise is unto our God. Lord, we think of many thousands, maybe millions in the country tonight, delirious over the World Series. But Lord, we thank you that we have something more intoxicating. We bless you for a perpetual intoxication, if it means joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in thee. But we bless you, Father, that you delivered us from this present evil world. Tonight we are marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. We intend to make it by the grace of God. And you said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Lord, every one of us tonight is a debtor to somebody who prayed for us when we didn't care. Tonight we're going to pray for others who don't care. They wouldn't even thank us. They're not even interested. The surest thing in the world is not death and taxes, it's death and eternity. And yet, Lord, we're so unconcerned. They wouldn't even thank us. They're not even interested. The surest thing in the world is not death and taxes, it's death and eternity. And yet, Lord, we're so unconcerned. But Lord, as we sang just a minute to go there, long my imprisoned spirit lay. Lord, we thank you for the day when our chains fell off, our bondage, our secret bondage. You broke it, you set the fetters off and made us free. We bless you tonight, we know in whom we have believed. We're persuaded that he is able to keep that which we've committed unto him against that day. Lord, we bless you for your holy word. Open it to us, we ask in Jesus' name. And the other one owns it all her daddy's estate. What a difference in the size. Look at the little thing and this big guy. You want to set that up for a minute? I have to read the scripture, I don't like a, a dedication. This is a dedication service. We don't sprinkle babies. Some people do, but that's the way they catch cold. <laughs> so we keep clear of that. You, you know where this is from, at least I hope you do. I'll just read it. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's from uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 80, it says the same thing almost, with one exception. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, but was in the desert until the days of his showing forth. That one, of course, is about John the Baptist. In the second one, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, and he was filled with wisdom. The next thing it says concerning him, he went uh, into the temple. It came to pass after three, three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors, a 12-year-old, both hearing and asking them questions. You remember what it said here in the, in the first reading? He's not only growing in grace, waxed strong in spirit but he was filled with wisdom the proof here is at 12 years of age he's sitting in the temple there were three synagogues the furthest one was for the doctors and lawyers and the super saints of their day and he goes into the third synagogue into the inner part of the temple like the holy of holies and here's a 12 year old boy what does it say 
verse 47 says they that heard him were astonished at his, at his understanding and answer the previous verse says he asked them questions <coughs> I'd like to know what he asked them wouldn't you it would be very very interesting but I don't have a clue but the fascinating thing is that he went into that inner part of the temple where the learned doctors were and almost all Bible uh, teachers, scholars anyhow agree that the greatest of the Hebrew scholars was Hillel and he was living at that time, he was almost a hundred years of age and he was revered partly because of his age and secondly because he had a kind of super wisdom and here's a little twelve year old boy asking questions of the most learned man in the world at that time he was almost a hundred years of age he had a rival by the name of Shammah and he was there at the same time I checked this to find that you, so you can tell I was making this up and there was another one called Jonathan he was, he was a compiler of the, the Chaldaic uh, uh, holy books as they call them then there was another one by the name of uh, Jonathan there was another one by the name of Simon he was the son of Hillel and then guess who, who the last one was that was there Nicodemus that later was going to come into the life of Jesus and here's a 12 year old boy asking them questions puzzling them and they were astonished at the wisdom which proceeded from him they were astonished at his understanding and his answers I don't believe they put a question to him that he didn't answer not as God but as a, as a specially anointed child you know we waste so many years in the lives of our children in England it's compulsory to go to school at five our boy that now has a PhD was reading I think when he was three years of age we waste so much time don't waste time with your children if I remember right the great hymn writer Isaac Watts let me, let me check on Jack here do you know his history at all? I think, I think he could speak Greek when he was seven and uh, Greek and Latin at nine and I don't know one or two other languages you see back in those di distant days you know when they didn't have high schools and poor souls didn't have TVs isn't it shocking what they had to go to school and no cheerleaders <laughs> they went to school to expand the brain to expand their understanding a whole host of those men that we call the I call them kind of supermen the men that we call the, uh, the Puritans were all knowledgeable of, of three or four languages by the time they were twelve the schools our boys went to they had to take a second language at about what eleven years of age seven I was behind you see I was always behind at school I'm, I'm always behind Martha she's ahead of me seven years of age you had to take a second language they say by the time you're five is it five years of age you've developed most of your intellectual powers and yet we waste them one way to waste your child's mind or a quick way to send them to hell is buy them their own TV for Christmas and don't monitor it you see the, the problem is you, if, you, uh, if you start educating your children and, and really getting them lined up the thing is by the time they're 13 they'll be smarter than you are at 30 and that's very rough and it's very rude of me to say it so I want to emphasize it <laughs> it's an awful responsibility actually to be a parent in these days it's going to get more and more difficult particularly as this terrible new age is breaking down on us they're going to have to be rooted and grounded it's no good yelling put the bible back in school I don't care a hill of beans whether they do or not I want to see the bible back in the home not prayer back in school prayer back how many of you take your children every day of your life and pray with them and read to the word to them and explain it to them if you don't you're not a, you're not a real Christian father I asked a woman one day boy she was a oh she was a lovely looking woman she was a, what they call the suicide blonde, blonde do you know what that is? died by her own hand <laughs> She got very angry. Well, don't, you're, not, you're not a suicide one, so don't worry. She got so angry when I talked about sin and so forth. 
She said, I want you to know I'm offended by your English tongue. I said, fine, come tomorrow night, you'll be offended more. <laughs> she said, I am, I'm offended. She said, do you know what? I belong in aristocratic American family. I am a pure-blooded American. I looked at her blue eyes and the blonde hair. I said, what reservation are you from? Boy, was she furious. I doubt if she's got over it now, and that's five years ago. Come on. I'm trying to lay heavily on you the responsibility of being a father or a mother in these evil days in which we're living. There's a whole list of presidents of the United States who all in their turn, unconscious of each other, paid tribute to the fact that they read the word of God almost every day of their lives or it was the underpinning factor in their lives. It's going to get harder and harder in this country and other countries to really stand by the word of the living God. Well, my prayer for these precious children is this. As the child grows, oh, how will you rejoice how they grow physically, which is good, emotionally, which is good, intellectually, which is good, but spiritually. Now, this is an amazing thing. You know, Mrs. Booth, the mother of the Salvation Army, as we call her, she had... Uh, I forgot how many children she had. They used to have families in those days. We don't have them anymore. Jonathan Edwards, he, he prayed. Jonathan Edwards prayed. I've got this in a book. Jonathan Edwards prayed and read the Bible 13 hours every day of his life. And he had 12 children. <coughs> 12 children. Did you know him personally, Dick? No. <laughs> well, you answered so powerfully. I thought you knew him. But Mrs. Booth, if I remember right, says that her children never cried after they were six months old. Think of that. And then when they got a little older, she went to bed every night, and before they slept, put her, ha her hand under the head of the baby, and said, and then and kissed it, and going out of the room said, Darling, sleep, the world is waiting for you. Not the town, the world. Every one of them became outstanding personalities. I saw two of those children, one a guy when he was about 50 odd, grey hair, which is a, uh, a sign of learning, isn't it, brother? <laughs> I met him, I met his oldest daughter, the Marashaw. I see some kids of the Maranatha group have been to uh, France and received very well. They danced in front of, uh, what they call that, that dame, uh, Malta dame, cathedral. <laughs> and they were well received. Isn't that wonderful? Christians going all the way to France to dance and do mimes? Dear God. Educated people pay all that money, all that Bible for it to dance? Oh, it's a Christian dance, of course. If there's such a thing. The crazy dance with everything. But in the 1900s, the mother Shaw, the oldest daughter of the founder of the Salvation Army, remember she went with a, a, a group of young English women, not because they were English, a group of women and they, they uh, rented a basement in one of the big factories in the middle of France in the middle of Paris and they hadn't been there many weeks before the place was jammed out with harlots, the worst criminals in town, the worst prostitutes and people from the Sorbonne came grey-bearded lecturers some of the greatest scholars of the day came and listened to this precious English lady who spoke French better than the French but as the beginning, they were taught at home. But William Booth said, every one of you is born for a purpose. These precious children, they're not born accidentally. They're not born just to bring honor to their father and mother. God has an eternal purpose for them. And I want to remind them that it's their business not just to see they grow a little longer and a bit fatter and smart intellectually, but grow spiritually. Remember that Hannah went every year to the temple. She gave a child. Had you ever thought of the heartache? Every year she went, she took him a new suit, he grew out of the last one. Every year she had the wrench of coming home without that child. She gave him once and forever he was God. The altar sanctifies the gift. What you put on the altar you can't take back. What kind of a child did she have? You've heard me pray so often here, and I still pray, both here and at home. I'm so tired of living amongst mediocrity, average people, 
God's looking for unusual men, unusual women. And it doesn't begin in the pulpit, it doesn't begin just in the home, or the school, or Bible school, it begins in the home. <coughs> I'm going to take the Indian baby first because, not, not any preference, but just because the Indians were here before we were here. <laughs> so you see what another, what's the baby called? Don't give me an Indian name. <laughs> Alison? I need to kind of look up, baby. You better put your hand on the mind. Father, we thank you for this precious life you've entrusted to these dear ones. Lord, bless dear Alison. We ask that right from her early days she may hate that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Lord, we have need of saintly, holy women. We pray that she will grow up to be a blessing to her parents and an honor to God and a tremendous addition to the Church of Jesus Christ. Sanctify her mind, sanctify her body, sanctify her emotions. Lord, don't let there be one usual thing about this child. Make her totally unusual. Yes, Lord. May she grow more rapidly in spirit, even on her parents. Yes, Lord. Lord, make her spiritually illumined, that she may be able to say, even if they can't hear, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Yes. So we commit her to you, Lord. Here she is. However long, long she lives, Lord, we believe that she lived to the glory of God. One day in eternity, this congregation will see this precious one mature in the presence of our holy God. Hallelujah. Now listen, bless you, dearie. She won't let me kiss her. <laughs> Twenty years from now, she'll let somebody else do that. <laughs> Maybe. If her daddy isn't watching. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Hannah. Isn't that beautiful? Don't put your arm on the line, sir. I'm, I'm scared. I, you know, I think they might snap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's looking round. They're not laughing at you, dear. They're laughing at me. Lord, we thank you for this precious babe. Thank you for trusting dear John and Linda. Loaning her. She's your property. Lord, I pray she'll, they'll guard this precious one. But again, there'll be inspiration to her. That she not only read about the things of God, but see the things of God in the lives of her parents. Again, I ask that body, soul, and spirit, you'll sanctify her. Take her for your own. May she grow up in maturity. Lord, I dare to believe for both of these babies, there's a place of destiny. They're not just ordinary children. They're born of sanctified parents for a purpose not to add to the world's population but to add to the kingdom of God both in their own lives and in the lives of others to this end we thank you and we bless you we bless dear Hannah in your name bye dear hold her tight don't drop her <laughs> I lost my burden let's sing a verse this is my story this is my song if you weren't here the other weeks, you won't know. But anyhow, for the next few weeks, we're going to study Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. Let me remind you again that faith is mentioned more than 300 times in the New Testament, only twice in the Old Testament. You know, there's a wonderful pattern in this uh, Hebrews 11, Remember that the common denominator is they had faith. It occurs that the key word in the chapter is faith. The key verse in the chapter is verse 6. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he is what? That he is all he says he is. If you let down to chapter 7 verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost. In another scripture, he is able to keep you from falling. In another scripture, he is able to make all grace to abound to you. What Psalm 46 begin with? No one remembers. Oh, thank you. I couldn't get... It's the second part of it. God is our refuge. He is our refuge. In other words, he is our all in all. The first character mentioned in this chapter, Hebrews 11, is who? A Abel. Why? 
because he worshipped and the key to every success in our Christian life is knowing how to worship I don't believe we know how to worship I, I found a very smart intelligent man this week came to my home I'll tell you why he's smart he agreed with all I said <laughs> which is unusual no but in the course of talking he said Brother Raymond I don't think we can worship collectively I said I don't either we, wor we, can, we can sing remember again I say prayer is preoccupation with our needs praise is preoccupation with our blessings worship is preoccupation with God I don't know if I have that verse here my goal is God himself not joy, not peace not even blessing but it's thee my God tis his to lead me there not mine but his by at any cost dear Lord any road one thing I know I cannot say him nay one thing I do I press toward my Lord my God my glory here from day to day and in the glory there thy great reward the first character then is Abel what did he do? he worshipped the second char character is Enoch what did he do? worship? maybe he did but he walked Abel walked Enoch worshipped the third character is Noah he worked you see faith isn't daydreaming a simple definition is faith takes God at his word takes God at his word I, I think in the first book I wrote I put a statement there that one day somebody's going to read the Bible and believe it and when they do it will all be embarrassed do you know that makes preachers so furious they say boy I read your book ten years ago and I can't get over a fret oh wonderful you mean I've kept you awake for ten years yes you said one day we'll uh, take the word of God and believe it well come on be honest why should, why should you be able to complain again the world doesn't believe God if we don't believe him there's two things Mrs. Bull said again to her children no it wasn't Mr. Bull, Mrs. Wesley said you have two things to do with the gospel believe it and behave it we've been he heavy on believing it but not behaving it dear Lord if we brought everybody to toe the line who's disobedient to the word of God our churches will be empty but remember partial obedience is disobedience the way for the children of Israel out of bondage was what? to take a lamb and slay it maybe it was a pet lamb we used to live in an old kind of an old relic of a castle in England the boys had we had a lot of sheep about 150 no in Ireland and the boys each had a lamb boy they grow so quickly Mary had a little lamb they followed her to school one day they used to follow our boys they used to get hold of them with the wool and pull them back we had to sell them one day oh boy that upset the house here's a lamb you have to slay it it isn't enough to slay it and take the blood and put it in a bowl in the house the angel of death would still come the blood has to be applied upon the lintels and the doorpost how many thousands of people are there who print our bibles and don't know a thing about them build our churches and never go in them and I can understand why they don't in some degree print the bibles and don't read it and don't believe it and they're going to have a greater judgment I think every time you go down the street and see a cross on a church that, that will come up against us at the judgment the more I read of the judgment I'm, I'm reading it by day and I can say before God by night you know last night I slept all night I couldn't believe it was me I like to go to bed between nine and half past go to bed half past nine get up at half past eleven and get a few hours with the Lord the phone doesn't you know we were going to have a quiet day today we had eight visitors today I tell them, listen, 15 minutes. Oh, I've come 500 miles. I don't care if you've come from Jupiter. My time's too precious. You get 15 minutes. A guy came from England. You know that wonderful country of England? Came a few weeks ago. I come all the way from England. I say, well, sit on the chair where others sit. Even if you sit, come from Van, you sit there. And I gave him a little more than half an hour. You know, the most precious thing we have, we think, is money don't spend your money frivolously but don't spend your time frivolously I'm only 20 you may be dead at 21 you don't have a lease on life the only thing any man in the world has is one beat of his heart that's all 
We need to sing, take time to be holy. We need to worship. One night we'll take a study now. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Let's go back now to Genesis. Read the story in the original. Not in the original Greek, uh, Hebrew. Just the original story. In chapter 4 of Genesis. I'm reading again from the King James Version, of course. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time it came to pass, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, from the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof. Why does it say the fat? To prove that he killed it. The fat isn't on the outside. It's telling us that he, did, he, he killed it in obedience. But the thing is, where did he get a clue from? I don't believe he was in the garden when... The first shedding of blood was not by man. The first shedding of blood, that is the animal blood, was when God took uh, the beasts and killed them and made skin coverings for the Adam and Eve. Do you think there was a clue in his mind? God could have to accepted something else, but he killed beasts covered us with the skin, he shed blood. And when that blood was shed, our shame was taken away. We were hidden because of the blood that was shed. I don't know whether that's the way or not. This I do know, that one man brings an offering from the ground. Verse 3. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Why didn't God accept the offering? That's all he could win. I'll tell you why he couldn't accept the offering of, of Cain. Look in verse 14 of the third chapter. The Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle. Verse 17, Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, watch it. I'm not facetious here. You hearken to the voice of your wife instead of me. You know, Abraham disobeyed God, and God says, Because thou hast heard a hearken to the voice of thy wife, God didn't speak to him for 15 years. And I'm not thinking just literally of the wife there but somebody very close to you take their advice against the advice that God gives and God is a jealous God the purest of love has jealousy in it and God is a jealous God and we don't think of that we think of his love all the time he's a jealous God I wonder how much he get. you know when we go to a meeting oh I didn't get much out of that meeting tonight but that's not the point how much did God get out of it not did the choir sing well not was the sermon good. What did God get out of it? Did he get worship? Did he get adoration? Did he get what he's looking for? Our only business on earth is to glorify God. It's to get to know him intimately. I noticed that Dr. Wilsby says of my dear old friend Dr. Toga, he knew God very closely, and he did. He wasn't the greatest preacher I've heard in my life. I've heard preaching in many countries around the world, and Toga was not the greatest but he had a more intimate fellowship with God than any man that I was ever with. Even to kneel with him, you could almost feel some vibes, as we might say, coming from him. And when he prayed, there was a holy hush. I prayed with him many times in a little office that uh, was half a length from here to the window. And he didn't put books on the shelves, he stood them up this way so he wouldn't be bothered to read them. He spent his time with God, worship, adoration. But the ground was cursed. And he wanted to bring the ground that was cursed, the fruit of the ground, and God said no. That's why these folk, that poor brother that got the, that million plus dollars from dirty, damnable dollars from the gamblers. Blood stained, sin stained, or tear stained, beer stained, blood stained, sin stained. And said it was an answer to prayer. That's a lie from hell. God doesn't want that. Well, it was to help young, young doctors. Listen, there are more than a thousand retired Christian doctors in America 
Why can't they pack up and go to the most parts of the earth? Nobody's challenged them to do it. And they're not rookies. They've experienced for now 34 years of medical practice. They could finish years, glory years, instead of staying at home playing golf and doing some other thing. But God is a jealous God. Everything that he receives has to be pure, even before he receives it. You couldn't take a lamb that was limping, that was lame. You couldn't take a lamb that had one eye out. You couldn't take a lamb with any defects. It had to be an antitype or a pre-type, if you like, of the Lord Jesus, a perfect lamb. Anyhow, he says he brought his offering. But verse 14 that we read again in the third chapter, The Lord said unto the serpent, Thou hast done this, thou art cursed. Go down to verse 17. And to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat, cursed is the ground for thy sake. And out of that cursed ground he tried to present a gift to God. It shall bring forth thorns and thistles. Let's go now into chapter 4 so we'd save some time. Unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth. He was very angry. You know, there's nothing, no anger worse, I think, than religious anger. I wonder why he was angry. I suggest to you that this was not the first time that this young man had, had made an offering to God. And after, after Abel came away from worship, which he did, because he offered, he offered a lamb, and I'm very, very suspicious about people coming to the altar. The altar is for one of two things, death or sacrifice. It's cheap to come to the altar now. I talked with a man not long ago, goes to a big church, 20 to 30 people come forward in our church every week. I don't know where they go. I guess about a dozen questions like that in the last month. Where do all these people go? It doesn't mean anything to come to the altar. People don't come broken hearted because of sin. They come and get a lift. They get an emotional lift. They feel better because they've said they're sorry. My dear friend, when you think of the cross, all it cost Jesus Christ, no necessity of people now, you're saved, you take up your cross and follow him. We don't say that to Christians these days. I kind of think that this young man had such worship of God, and his brother had nothing but his miserable possessions, and when his brother comes back from worship, he'd been up the hills, he comes back, and he delighted himself in God and his brother thought, where in the world do you get this delight? Where do you get this joy? You see, people say it's boring going to church. It sure is. I guess you heard of the preacher that said on Wednesday night next week, I want to meet all the board members in my church. 700 turned up. <laughs> they were all bored. What greater joy is there than being married to the will of God? And here, way there in the beginning, this fellow has no, he can't pick up a Bible. There is no Bible. There's nothing written. Maybe the Spirit bore witness with him that this is the way to do it. And I'm sure in his heart he knew his brother. I can't think this was the first time that Cain punched Abel on the nose. I guess many times he was angry and envious of him. He's so light-hearted, he's so free. He moves in a dimension I don't know anything about. And therefore he got more and more angry. And then when the offering was received by God, the sacrifice, the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wrath? And why art thou... Why is thy countenance fallen? So in verse 5 here you have anger. There's his first sin, anger. In verse 7 you have sin. This is the first time sin is mentioned in the word of God. Thou doest not well. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Come down to verse 9. Of oh, verse 8 we read. It came, came talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. I kind of think he'd beaten him up many times. And maybe Abel didn't think it would be any worse this time than the last. But this time he slew him. Verse 9, the Lord said unto him, Where is thy brother Abel? And he said, I know not. See what the first thing was? In his sin, he got angry. 
and the second thing is he slew his brother and the third thing he became a liar thy brother's blood cries to me from the ground let me remind you again briefly George Fox you must read the life of George Fox that famous Quaker the man that made leather breeches because his others wore out riding horses and playing he went into Litchfield dear Martha and I used to drive through Litchfield in England it has a cathedral with red stone two, two towers instead of one going through the town he said my feet began to burn so he took his shoes off the Lord said take off thy shoes he put them under a hedge he said raise your hand walk right through town it was market day they were selling cattle selling fruit and he marched through town with his hands in the air at the top of his voice crying woe unto Litchfield thou bloody city our preachers didn't say that of Tyler in the pulpit never mind on Main Street woe unto Litchfield thou bloody city woe unto Litchfield thou bloody city when he got through the city he said I felt such a relief he said I thank the Lord for strength and the Lord said, you'll need more, you to go back and do it again. <laughs> you think the Lord has no humor? So he said, I walked through, and people came out of the butcher's shop, and the drugstore was called the apothecary. The man came out of the apothecary. They said, who is this man? Who is this wild man? Oh, he's George Fox. He's founding a new uh, branch of Christianity called Quakers. Anyhow, he walked through the city again, and he said, when I got to where my shoes were my feet were not burning I put them on more than a year after he was staying in the home of a wealthy Quaker Cadbury's chocolate in England they're Quakers and fries are Quakers lots of very very as you say multi-million dollar people are Quakers they're very rigid they won't fight in wars lots of things they won't do they keep the Sabbath rigidly they take care of the poor share their money build uh, wonderful schools and children can go, or used to go, free education. Anyhow, he went to this Quaker's house for supper. And supper wasn't ready, so the, the good man said, Go into my library. It's open, it was all thee and thou. Thou canst go into my library. And he said he went in, he took down a volume, and he opened this great volume. And what did it say? Litchfield. And he read, 200 years before, in Litchfield, a bunch of Christians have been martyred and he said Lord I didn't realize when my feet were burning and the Lord said your feet were burning because of those martyrs who had been there for 200 years their blood was crying from the ground he says my brother's blood crieth from the ground I've told you there's a book, you should get it, you fellows for your children, too. What's it called? Martyrs? What's it called, Jack? Pardon? No, no, no. A far better book than Fox's. Martyrs Mirror. It's a big book. It weighs six and a half pounds. Cost you thirty-two dollars. It's worth it. You know, as I handle that, yeah, I handle it today, show you it to a pastor. The blood of everybody martyred. The blood from every battlefield, whether you go back to France, Passchendaele, Binny Ridge, Somme. What was it, 600,000 people destroyed in the Battle of Somme when I was a kid in 1914, 18 war. All the people killed in the Franco-Prussian War, in the Roman Empire, in the British Empire, in the Medo-Persian Empire. All that blood cries to God from the ground. Blood is sacred. Thy brother's blood crieth from the ground. And remember there's another scripture in Hebrews says the blood of Christ speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. This is the blood of condemnation. Thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Cain, Cain said, Lord, in verse uh, 13, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You know, I'm convinced of this, that true revival meetings, when the Holy Spirit of God begins to convict people, it's like having open heart surgery without an anesthetic. God opens the prison house of memory. You can talk about the subconscious and all you like. God only has to open that door by conviction. 
I remember preaching in that great Methodist church right opposite Abbey Theatre where uh, George Handel first played the Messiah. Preached at a conference there on Psalm 51, I remember. Two and a half years afterwards, I went to a conference in the north of Ireland and a man came to me and said, Do you remember me? I said, No. He said, You preached in the Methodist church at that conference? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, in Dublin. He said, Do you know that night my wife and I went, good Methodist? So there must be bad ones because they were good ones. He said, we went real good Methodist. And he said, the Lord got hold of me. We went home, had our usual cup of tea and a cookie or a biscuit, we say, to go to bed. Went to bed. My wife sat on one side of the bed, I sat on the other. He said, you know, that, that friendly, loving couple? Get into bed. Get into bed yourself. Are you going to get into bed? Are you going to get into bed? No. He said, it went on like that till after 12 o'clock, till 1 o'clock. Then he said, I got all of the bed and I yanked it away from the wall and my wife walked around that way and I walked this way. Miserable in our sins. Then he said, suddenly she collapsed and, at the bedside and cried, oh God have mercy on me, save me. Oh, it's all right for her. He said, I just sat on the bed. She just lay there in bed, muttering, weeping, cry, uh, praying. He said, a little later, he said, every sin I ever committed all rose up and marched round the bedroom. I could hear the tramp of my feet, their feet. Sins of youth, sins of manhood, open sins, secret sins, sins of the flesh, sins of the spirit. They marched in parade. You know, it's one thing to sing, my chains fell off. It's another thing to say, long my imprisoned spirit lay. You know, God has power to recall every sin that you and I have ever committed unless you're under the blood. But I want to tell you something. I, I write little aphorisms, try to write one every day. Uh, the, the holiness of God, the holiness of God will not ignore the sin that is, the mercy of God will not ignore uh, the sin which His holiness condemns. If He condemns it, brother, we're in for trouble. But if it's under the blood, People say, oh, I get troubled sometimes about some sin I did before I was saved. Well, forget it. He said he's thrown it in the abyss of his forgetfulness. Never to be remembered against us anymore forever. Boy, if that doesn't make you shout, you're in bad shape. Even if you're not Pentecostal. <laughs> All the sins you ever committed, sins of the flesh, sins of the spirit, sins of you, Sins you do remember, sins you don't remember, sins other people bring up against you. So uh, forget what they say. We're justified in his sight. But you see, this guy went the wrong way. He, his tongue is stained with lying, his hands are stained with blood, his heart is stained with anger and enmity and hatred. What did he feel like when he saw his brother's blood? No, no blood had ever been shed, human blood. And isn't it amazing? It was a brother that killed his brother that started the whole bloody mess. Yes, and since that blood there's been a river of blood I honestly believe in my heart that human history is not written with ink on, on pages of, 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 of uh, paper human history is written in blood on the parchment on the skins of men and women verse 16 says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod you see, it wasn't enough to have done what he did. He ran away from the presence of God. Did he ever do that? I'll tell you when God the Holy Ghost is on a church, not when you talk about its numbers, when people do not go in. And when they get in, they're, they're irritable. They want to get out as quickly as they can from the presence of God. That happens in revival. People go to a meeting and they don't go forward, but they go backward in more ways than one. And what they do? They suffer agonies. Because God is trying to heal them, but often he has to wound us. This man must have felt terribly wounded. He's stained with lying, he's stained with murder, he's stained with disobedience. How in the world did he face his father and mother? Well, he knew what sin did. Either his father and mother tell the story. It said God drove them out of the Garden of Eden, the paradise, the, the most perfect place in the world, and yet they messed it up. If we put this world right, unless Jesus Christ rules lives, it will be as bad in six months. It takes the miracle of grace to transform human personality. He was driven out of the, out of the grounds. 
And God says to him in verse 11, Now thou art cursed. The devil was cursed, the land was cursed, and he says, Now thou art cursed from the earth. I'm looking for a verse, there's a verse that says here somewhere, God put a mark upon him. Can you see that? What verse is it? One? Fifteen? Thank you. The Lord said, whosoever shall say, and the Lord set a mark, now listen, he put a mark on Cain, why? Lest any finding him. Well, according to some people, there's only four people in the earth. His father and mother wouldn't slay him, lest any finding him. There must have been a lot of people on the earth. I read one record, I don't know how they made it, there were 11,000 people on the earth by the time this thing finalized this chapter but lest any finding him should slay him a mark upon him you know we're moving up to that time very quickly I think when we're going to have to sign up straight with God or wear the mark of the beast people say I won't do that the government won't get me well uh, open your billfold why because you've got an identity card haven't you it's already got your number so you can't back away from it and I tell you I believe we're going into a greater conflict than ever right now this new age theory that's coming is all anti-Christian every bit of it this new stuff that Oral Roberts is the head of that fellow Pork is in with him and Pork says his sister comes into his office and talks with him she's been dead over, uh, over a year and then she comes and talks in his office and yet they've launched this what, uh, group of charismatics. They're going to change the world. Nothing of the kind. The Holy Ghost alone can do it. His business is to convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Lest any finding him should slay him. And it says in verse 17, Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. Isn't it amazing? Huh? I'm not facetious here, but I, I don't know the background of uh, dear Spence and his wife that much, or John and his wife. I'm not suggesting they're like, uh, but like Cain. But that Cain, the wicked man, should bear Enoch, the man that walked with God all his life. We'll talk about him next week. This man worships. Abel worships. Enoch walks. But what does this verse say? He knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. What did he do? He built a city. So there you are, right after coming out of Eden. They become materialistic. What does it say? It says Cain built a city. What does it say about Abraham? What did he do? Fun? good for you ten marks Cain built a city Abraham looked for a city John saw the city you know you and I boy we're, we're going to have the hottest judgment that any human have ever had since the day of Pentecost I believe why because we have a complete revelation of God God has nothing to add to it dear Lord instead of our church is being crippled and powerless and fireless they ought to be throbbing with the Holy Ghost people ought to be rushing there I told a preacher the other day, I said, Brother, and I'm not facetious about any of these things, they're light-hearted, I ache, I weep. I get out of bed at night, go to my closet and pray, wait on God. I'm wondering to somebody, I don't care what the Pentecostal testimony is, but the pastor can stand at the door, throw the doors open and say to the world outside, a world that's scarred by the evangelical witness of the last two or three years, not only scarred, it's scared because of the coming judgment. A poll was made recently by one of the leading groups in the country, leading newspaper, uh, monthly papers. What are you afraid of? What, what's your number one problem? Fear. I can't give you the exact list, but this was it. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of cancer. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of an atomic war. What are you afraid of? Oh, I, I'm afraid that the banking system will collapse. I'll lose all my inheritance and everything. And they went down the list. I'm afraid of personal injury. I'm afraid of death. 
I'm afraid of war. I'm afraid of uh, atomic, en- uh, atomic war. I'm afraid of a, a Russian invasion. Do you know, out of about 25 answers, not one person said they were afraid of God? Not one. But listen, it's not there's no fear of God before the eyes of the man in the street. There's no fear of God in the pew. There's no fear of God in the pulpit. There's no fear of God in the seminary. Dear God, with all his majesty and glory, as I read to you last week, I used to use it in the open air so so often, in the tenth chapter of this marvelous book. And remember, this book actually, that is, the epistle to the Hebrews, hasn't one word to say to sinners. It's all to believers. Let us, let us, we, 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 it says all through the book. It says in chapter 10, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We say that to the drunkard and the harlot. But that's a fearful thing for me and you to fall into the hands of the living God. He isn't going to dim his holiness. He isn't going to lessen his power because you've served him for 40 years as a missionary or something. It's a fearful thing for me to say I'm a Christian. It means I'm Christ's one. Christ has my mind. Christ has my thinking. Christ has my heart. Christ has my interest. I'm not interested in world series. I'm interested seriously about the world. And there's going to have to be a tremendous revolution. Finishing with this one thing, when you come down to what, chapter 12 or 13, where it says, what, without what? Without miracles, no. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And Jesus didn't die to save us from hell. That's a fringe benefit. He died to get total occupation of us, to be holy in speech, in acts, in desires. Do you wonder that, dear Wesley, let me quote him once again. Uh, There was a lady called Madame Burigno. She lived a hundred years before John Wesley. Uh, he found a hymn of hers on a piece of ragged paper and all his life he, he loved that hymn written by, written by a petite little French label she wrote this come Savior Jesus from above assist me with thy heavenly grace empty my heart of earthly love that's where it starts he's not coming to be a shareholder forget it God doesn't want to share your life he wants to own it he doesn't want partnership he wants ownership of every part of my being Come Saviour Jesus from above, assist me with thy heavenly grace. Empty my heart of earthly love and for thyself prepare the place. Nothing on earth do I desire, listen, nothing on earth do I desire but thy pure love within my breast. This, only this will I require and freely give up all the rest, wealth, honour, pleasure and what else this short enduring world can give. Tempt as ye will, my soul rebels, for Christ alone resolve to live. Thee will I love and thee alone with pure delight and inward bliss. To know thou takes me for thine own. There's a girl going home to her mother tonight. She says, Mother, you know, I've been, uh, been going out with Jim for five years. And he's a lovely man. He's a lovely character. He's a godly man. Do you know tonight he proposed? Do you think he's ever going to be the same from here to eternity? That young man could have chosen out of a hundred girls in the church. He chose me. He chose me. I've got to realize that he chose me. I didn't choose him, he chose me. Nothing on earth do I desire. This only this will I require. And freely give up all the rest. Wealth, honor, pleasure. And what else this short enduring world can give. Tempt as ye will, my soul repels. For Christ alone resolve to live. Thee will I love and thee alone with pure delight and inward bliss. To know thou takes me for thine own unworthy me, undeserving me unuseful me to know thou takes me for thine own oh what a happiness is this that path with humble speed I seek in which my saviour's footsteps shine nor will I think nor will I speak of any, any other love but thine henceforth may no profane delight divide this consecrated soul Possess it thou who hast the right as Lord and Master of it all. It's easy to sing. But remember, John Wesley was one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. He spoke a number of languages. Read his Bible almost every day in in English and and, uh, in Latin and in, uh, in French. And yet at the end of his life, sure he made a lot of money. A guy challenged me not long ago. He said, well, you're talking about Wesley he didn't die penniless no he died next to him 
He made a lot of money, sure he did. He had one of the biggest incomes of any man. And all he did was ride horseback and preach. But what did he do with his money? He built orphanages. And he built schools. And he built churches. And he printed Bibles. And he printed Methodist hymn books. That's what he did with his money. All his money was sanctified. When he died he left six pound notes. So that he said get six poor men to carry me to my grave and give them each a pound note which was maybe worth twenty five dollars those days. So he had six men each got a pound note. He had a handful of well, he had six silver spoons. Do you know the IRS got after him for having six silver spoons, even in his day? Where do you get them? What do you want with six silver spoons? An old lady gave me it. That old lady has done so much good in history, hasn't she? It's always an old lady, does it? An old lady gave me six silver spoons. I have six pounds. A handful of books. A Geneva gown that he preached in. That's all he had. Six pound notes, six silver spoons. A handful of books. A Geneva gown and... Uh, something else what was the other thing he left oh I know I knew something the Methodist church <laughs> all out of one man who got kicked out of the church of England the bishop of Gloucester said that man Whitfield will never preach in my church do you know the name of that bishop no you don't nobody else does but all the world Christian world knows about George Whitfield he got kicked out like the rest of them they were too hot to handle Boy, it'd be great to have some preachers too hot to handle. But God is the same God. The God who was with Wesley. The God who saw this man through. All right, the last thing. What did Abel get killed for? Well, I'd like to give you a scriptural definition. The scripture says because he was righteous. If you want to prune a church, I'll tell you what, preach righteousness, you lose 80% of your congregation. Then if you want to lose another 10%, preach holiness. Righteousness is my relationship with my fellow man. Holiness is my relationship with God. We're lacking both of them these days. Righteousness. Righteous, Abel, the word of God said. Zechariah. Zechariah was killed between where? The doorpost and the altar. Why? Because he preached righteousness. We're going to come down to Noah. What did Noah do? You say, Noah built an ark. No, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. But it says in Jude, he wasn't killed for building an ark. What was he killed for? He preached righteousness. And people won't have stand for righteousness. You can preach about the second blessing, the second coming, the second anything else. But don't get down where they live. Don't get about their unrighteous acts, their unrighteous thinking, their unrighteous practices. You start talking about it being bondage. Maybe it is. Tell you what, it's glorious bondage. I'm not, I'd much rather have bondage of relationship with him than bondage that people have in the world anyhow. So we, we leave Abel there. Didn't live very long. I told a young guy the other day, I said, brother, it's not how long you live, it's how you live that matters. Brainard didn't live long. McShane didn't live long. Henry Martin didn't live long. He might have been one of the greatest diplomats in England, but he left England, went to India. Was there less than seven years. He took the original Greek and translated it into Hindustani. Then he went back to his Greek and translated it into uh, Arabic, one of the most difficult languages in the world. And yet the, the whole gospel, really, in India sprouts out of that, that one young man. And he came out of a church. I loaned a brother a book today. And the pastor of that church was influential. I don't know what else is. In leading one young man into experience with God, Henry Martin. And that's the way God works. These people also varied in what they did, but they all had faith. Enoch had faith to walk. Noah had faith to work. Abraham had faith, he saw a city afar off. And it never dimmed in his thinking, his understanding. We can see it all as we read this blessed word. We've got, we've got the end chapter of human history. Not only that, we've got something beyond the end chapter, we've got a revelation from God himself. But remember, faith 
as a grain of mustard seed. I remind you again, Paul's anxiety for the people at Thessalonica, I'm praying night and day, not for sinners, not for drunkards, not for harlots, not for the overthrow of the Roman Empire, I'm praying for your faith. I pray night and day that I may see your faith and help complete your faith. In the second epistle chapter when he says your faith groweth exceedingly. But faith is going to be trusted, is going to be tested. We need to know that. We have one single reason to be unbelievers because we've got this precious word, God's faithfulness. Well, we'll come back to it next week, at least to part of it. Uh, tonight, Oh, I've got something that will cheer the heart of my Indian friends here today. A brother called me and uh, asked for prayer in our service tonight for a man, what was his name? <coughs> his name is Leonard Everly, E-V-E-R-L-Y. And he prayed for him. He says, this man has committed his life to evangelizing Indians in, in America. But... Uh, two or three years ago he had a, an enormous growth he had a tumour it weighed 18 pounds when they took it out of him then after that he had cancer the tumour if I remember right he wouldn't let the surgeon put a, a knife on him but anyhow the, the tumour went but after that he got cancer and maybe it was after he got the cancer he wouldn't let them touch him but he had a healing, but now the cancer is coming back. And he asked that we pray for him tonight. And he said, this man really loves the Indians. He gives his life for the Indians. I talked with another man this week. From, uh, he's from Cincinnati. At least his friend is. There's a, there's a reckless young man there. Boy, I love reckless young men. It's a, it's a holy recklessness. He goes into the town square once a week, Thursday and meets everybody that comes and in a little over a month he's had 88 people out of the street not, not kids out of Sunday school kids out of the street raw raw unbelievers rebels against 88 of them have been saved in the last two months there's a young fellow stands in the square where our Dave what used to live in Christchurch New, New Zealand every day of his life he stands there at the other end of the square there's an atheist this young guy stands with his Bible and preaches the word of God. There have been so many encouraging things this week that this young man's given his life to serve the Indians. This man's given his life to stand in his own city and witness there. And somebody else told me about some prayer meeting somewhere, I don't know where that was. Except that there are people again that are really recognizing the lateness of the hour in which we're living. There's not much time left. We better put on the whole armor of God. We better, Lord, teach us, teach us, teach us what it means to really trust God, to exercise faith, believe God in this very late hour. We're not responsible for Finney's day or Wesley's day. We're responsible for our day. And I want rest. Either I want to see the glory of God or else go to glory. One of the two. No matter which, to me, in one sense. But I want to see God's name vindicated in this rotten day in which we live. I want to see some house of God where 24 hours a day it's open so people can go. We don't close the, the, the hospitals for eight, after 8 hours a day or the police station or somewhere. Why should the churches all be locked up tonight? By the way, we've got four young men coming down from Lubbock uh, next week. Uh, they said that Spencer was going to take care of where they slept, so that's nice. Spencer's going to hang them up in this place. There's no room to lay down, I'm sure. Anyhow, there's four young men coming, Tanga, all the way from Lubbock, because they're hungry. They want to come to pray. And this dear brother away from uh, Oklahoma tonight. So let's remember this brother, as the Lord enables us. Uh, remember particularly Dave Wilkerson's work. I don't know what's happening up in New York and uh, their uh, Joe Foss my I admire that little guy he was in the state prison in uh, Missouri wasn't he this week oh, oh it's still on 
Yeah, yes, he says it's psychic and uh, hormones and loaded with AIDS. He said the very atmosphere when you go in reminds me of uh, what was that? Alan Gardner, the two Alan Gardners. One went to Tierra del Fugo. If ever you see the story, read it, it'll turn you on your ear. He went down there and died. The other Alan Gardner went to, uh, from England to Egypt. He said, when I, got, when I got off the boat in that Mohammedan country, as soon as I got off, he said, the whole atmosphere was cloying. It got hold of me. It's so full of hedonism and superstition. So let's uh, uphold the hands of the, uh, that little giant. Joe was in that prison with all those, I don't know, there's thousands of men that are there. Just as degenerate and corrupt as any men on earth. The trouble is, many of those guys, you know, they've passed by church doors hundreds of times and never felt a drawing power to go in. They've seen Bibles, didn't want to read them. This is, this is a horrible thing. Every church door will testify against men in that day. Every time they pass a graveyard and see a cross, it will testify against them in that day. We're without excuse. And dear God, I think without excuse more than anybody saw you. I've got all the exceeding great and precious promises of God. Spurgeon said this is God's checkbook with blank checks. Fill them in and by faith write your name and say they're already paid in the name of Jesus. And he did it. And I want God to move us up in faith. Not just praying but faith, believing. They didn't get the promises of God in Hebrews. Why? Because they had no faith. They just said words. Let's really pray. When you pray, I'm praying with you. Others pray. For Joe, pray for this brother going to the Indians. Pray for the, uh, the Spence and the other Indians when they go back to Oklahoma, that God will do a strange work there. I want God to get us angry that he bypasses us and uses somebody else. I'd love to hear there's a Holy Ghost revival in, in, in Russia. There's one in the middle of Africa by the, what they call the Maisa tribe, M-A-I-S-A, Maasai. You know, men are walking, walking 20 and 30 miles to meetings because God has come down. Half people won't come Sunday because the air conditioner isn't working in the car. These people are walking 20, 30 miles. I say again, you never have to advertise a fire. Once the fire of God falls, they'll come. It will outrival sports or drinking clubs or any other hellish thing. They're tired. Our words have no meaning. Our words have no power. Paul said, I preach not in word only, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost isn't getting excited, running up and down, then singing a half a dozen choruses to get people to the altar. When the Holy Ghost is there, people come to the altar without being asked. They don't always walk to the altar, they run. They don't always run, sometimes they walk on their hands and knees. This is strange language to us. We're used to a nice, quiet church. You can go in and come out as you, as you went in. That's going to change. There's a hunger among some people, some here, some elsewhere. We want to believe God, want to see God work. Overthrow the powers of darkness. So let's go to prayer if you... Uh, have to go, don't, don't go to escape praying. But if you have to go, go, we'll, let's sing a chorus. <laughs>